on Larry King now, John Krasinski. You've had an interesting career. Uh, you go from The Office to a uh, Michael Bay action movie. Just do, like that. Do you strategize your career? I'm a realist. You know, when people say, is it, is it frustrating that you'll always be known as Jim from The Office? I said, not at all. In fact, it's a huge compliment. I think that's one of the greatest honors I'll have in my career. People have asked me before, what's your, what's your biggest influence comedically? And I said, without a doubt, it's Conan O'Brien. He's so incredibly smart. He's so incredibly self-deprecating, but he's allowed to be silly. And on top of it, as we discussed earlier, he's one of the greatest human beings you'll ever meet. We're going to do a movie and break it into 10 parts every season. Wow. Yeah. But it's a great part for you. Some it's a great part. people have played him. Yes, absolutely. Harrison Ford, Alec Baldwin. <laughs> Hacks. I mean, let's be <laughs> honest. It's time, for, it's time for a real professional yeah, to take great. on this role. Plus, oh, you're married to a famous person, Emily Blunt. I married up, and that's what you wanted to say, and that's fine. I shook her hand, and to be honest, I knew, uh, I knew right then and there that I felt uh, uh, everything I needed to feel for her. All next on Larry King Now. Welcome to Larry King Now. Our guest is actor, writer, director John Krasinski, once best known as the lovable Jim Alpert on The Office. John has gone on to prove his range in roles in movies like It's Complicated, 13 Hours, and Promised Land. And now John's back in the director's chair at the helm of The Hollers, in which he also stars. The Hollers is in theaters August 26. I hear it was very difficult getting this made. It was, yeah. What I happened? actually, I signed on about six or seven years ago as an actor. And I don't know if I've signed on to a script uh, quicker because I have seen a lot of family movies. I'm sure you have too. And uh, they're not always uh, great for me because I feel a little bit manipulated into the idea of family. And this was the most real, specific, and honest take on family I had read in a while. So I jumped on as an actor. And then four years later, the financier at the time called me and said, I can't get this movie made, as happens with these smaller movies. And would you like to buy the script outright from me and make it on your own? And I said, I think you made the wrong call. I'm not George Clooney. <laughs> um, and then after thinking about it for a while, I decided I had to do it because this story was so specific and I'm a big family guy and I thought... Did you uh, buy it cheap at least? Not so cheap. No. The idea was if I could make it, uh, if I could change and do it very quickly, um, I'm not a guy who has things sitting around on the shelf. If I'm involved in something, I want to do it. So I think two days after buying the script, I called Margot Martindale because my whole idea was if I'm going to do this, I'm going to direct and get the best cast I can. And you're also going to be in it and direct it. Yes. Have you ever done that before? I have done it before, but not to this level. I, I was, a, you know, being the, the lead in the movie was uh, a much bigger challenge. But weirdly for this movie, acting and directing at the same time was uh, not only easy, but it was very imperative. And the reason why is because I think the key to this movie is making this family feel organic and real. And the only way I could do that was by not being the guy behind the camera that's yelling cut and giving people notes. It would ruin this sort of special vibe that the cast started to have on set. So being the guy in the scenes, we would just not let the camera cut. We would talk. Um, very quietly amongst ourselves and basically when we thought we had the scene done they didn't even know the cameras were rolling it almost felt like a play who are you I'm playing John Holler so uh, I'm a guy who is living in New York uh, trying to be an artist and gets the call that his mother has a brain tumor and goes home to take care of her and in doing so I think opens up the channels of communication and love that have long since been dormant in this family and uh, it's about getting back to your family that that you may or may not have a great relationship with but uh, at least you have to try is he married He's not yet married. He's, uh, he's got a girlfriend who's pregnant uh, on the way with twins, and he's having a hard time uh, understanding that level of, uh, of responsibility and also deciding whether or not he's the right man for uh, his girlfriend. So it's a very, it's a very modern sort of uh, a modern take on a, a relationship. Comedy as well? Absolutely, yeah. It's mostly, you know, it, it's, it's a comedy in that these characters are absolutely... Um, special and and funny in a way, but the the terms that they all get together are uh, are very dramatic. It's very real. You would think that an actor would make a good director because she understands acting. I hope so. Um, I, I think that's what the uh, the cast has been very nice to say that. I think that you understand directing. One of the best parts about being an actor, and there are many. One of the best parts about being an actor is you get to watch all these great directors uh, work. And I think the name of the game there is just steal everything. So I've stolen uh, ideas and thoughts and, and uh, moves from the directors that I've worked with. Certainly George Clooney um, taught me so much. One of the things I always remember he told me was um, you, can make a bad, you can make a bad movie out of a good script, but you can never make a good movie out of a bad script, so always choose wisely. 
And then the other thing he always told me was, um, uh, you know, the best idea has to end up on screen. Doesn't matter who said it, one of your actors or the guy who's shutting down the studio at night. If it if it's going to make the movie better, it has to go on screen. It's a team sport. He's a terrific guy. He's an amazing yeah. guy. He's, yeah, he's he a regular is. guy. <laughs> he really is, which is so people wouldn't believe it, but he is. You've had an interesting career. Uh, you go from The Office to a uh, Michael Bay action movie. Just you, like that. Do you strategize your career? I think you, you know, strategy I think is a scary thing because it can get you in trouble. I think you can have hopes, you can have aspirations. I certainly, I'm a realist, so I understand that, you know, when people say, is it, is it frustrating that you'll always be known as Jim from The Office? I said, not at all. In fact, it's a huge compliment. I think that's one of the greatest honors I'll have in my career. That show is everything to me. I was a waiter before I got that job, so I'm living a lottery ticket life. I mean, I, I really am. And so I almost feel like I don't deserve to have gotten that opportunity, so I'm trying to deserve the idea of staying here in, this, in the opportunity that Did I have. Did you ever watch the British version of the audience? All the time, yeah. all the time. And hilariously, I, that got me in trouble because in my audition, uh, I was auditioning for the role in New York, and uh, I was the last person to go in. And just before I went in, they took a lunch break, which was unfortunate. And so I watched 100 people leave the office and come back with uh, sandwiches and salads. And one guy sat across from me and said, are you nervous? And I said, no, you either get these things or you don't. It's not a big deal. What I am nervous about is, you know, the U.S. has a tendency to just kill these amazing British shows. They take the idea and they make it worse. And he said, I'm Greg Daniels. I'm the executive producer. And I almost threw up on his shoes. <laughs> <laughs> Now, you're going to be Jack Ryan? You're the new I'm Jack? I'm going to be Jack Ryan, yes. You're that looking at the series is continuing on Amazon? It is, yes. So Paramount Pictures has uh, moved it to... You have no to, books left to do. So. You have no books, that's right. So we're going to do Pulled from the Headlines. We're taking the ideas and the character of Jack Ryan and we're going to do uh, a series. But it's funny because the pitch to me was Carlton Cuse, the showrunner, who's incredible. And he's done... He was one of the uh, first guys at Lost. Um, he basically said, we're not doing a television series. Uh, and I thought, yeah, that's a good battle of semantics and he said no the, the truth is a two-hour format for Jack Ryan may not be the best format for the character because Tom Clancy's books are so detailed and rich and the character's superpower if he has one is his intelligence so he has to you know draw things out and problem solve so this 10-part thing we're gonna do a movie and break it into 10 parts every season Wow. Yeah. But it's a great part for you. Some it's a great part. people have played him. Yes, absolutely. Harrison Ford, Alec Baldwin. <laughs> Hacks. I mean, let's be honest. <laughs> it's, time for, it's time for a real professional yeah, to take right. on this role. Our guest is John Krasinski. Up next, John on his industry roots and managing fame. Stay with us. We're back with John Krasinski. The Hollers will open August 26th. He's, of course, so well known from uh, so many great roles, and actually, The Office began it all. You went to Brown University. I did, indeed. Is that school, uh, Ivy League school, mm -hmm. equal to its reputation? For me, it far surpassed its reputation. To me, um, you know, one of the things that Brown has is it doesn't have a core curriculum. So it, it, from the moment you walk through the gates, your destination and your, uh, your career there is your own responsibility, meaning no one's going to make you take math and science and English. You actually get to decide what classes you want to take from day one. So they try to develop free thinkers, and certainly there's a way to manipulate that system and, and basically uh, art and, uh, you can make it a little easier on yourself or you can make it harder. Their whole point in doing that, um, they also have pass-fail classes. You can take classes for a grade or pass-fail. Their intention there is that you take things that are out of your comfort zone, which I, uh, I did. Um, and thank God it was pass fail because <laughs> I actually got major, out of my comfort did you zone. Major in anything? I did. I majored in English and graduated with honors in creative writing. Wow! Thank you. If I impress Larry King, I'm doing something right. And, and you were you were an intern for Conan? I was an intern for Conan O'Brien my junior year of uh, college. For a summer. For a summer, and I was his script intern. And I can be very honest. People have asked me before, what's your What's your biggest influence comedically? And I said, without a doubt, it's Conan O'Brien. I've always been a fan of comedy, but every single night, and this is true, I probably shouldn't be saying this because my parents will watch this, I spent every single night watching Conan O'Brien in my entire college career. To me, there was something very different, fresh, and so smart about what he did. He's so incredibly smart, he's so incredibly self-deprecating, but he's allowed to be silly. There are very few people who can do what they do, and on top of it, as we discussed earlier, he is one of the greatest human beings you'll ever meet. He is Wonderful. so kind and so genuine. He's a great writer. He's an amazing Were writer. Were you on his show? 
I was, I've been on his show, I was just on his show last night, but I, it's funny that you mentioned that. The, 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 one of the most surreal moments of my entire life has been the first night I went on that show. So I was his intern, so I knew his whole crew, his whole uh, operation, and as I'm walking down the hallway, I'm seeing all these people who used to be my boss now clapping and saying welcome and congratulations, and I get to the blue curtain back on the 1230 slot in MEC, and they pulled the curtain, and I blacked out. That is not an exaggeration. I totally blacked out, don't remember anything until Conan was shaking my hand and pushed me into the couch and said everything's going to be fine. And when he said that, I woke up and I realized that I was the nerd who, when I was an intern, <clears throat> would, after hours, sit on the couch and pretend to be interviewed by nobody. So now I was being interviewed by Conan O'Brien, and it was uh, it was pretty unbelievable. And then at the end, if you go back and watch the interview, which everybody can do thanks to the internet, um, you can see that I actually end up tearing up because at the end he takes a moment in the segment to say how proud he is of me, and, and I'll never forget it. We're good friends, and he's yes. on there a lot. Uh, I know. He <laughs> loves you. <laughs> I love him. Oh, you're married to a famous person, Emily Blunt. I married up. And that's what you wanted to say, and that's fine. How did you meet her? Um, I met her at a restaurant. Just uh, I was sitting at a table with a friend, and um, we were talking about different things. And then a friend two tables over uh, said, oh, there's my friend John, came over and, and said, you should meet Emily. <clears throat> and I looked over, and it was Emily Blunt. And uh, I was incredibly nervous, because I was a big fan, and probably too big a fan of the Devil Wears Prada. So I tried to contain my excitement when I met her. So how did it work out if you come by as a sheepish nerd? <laughs> I was, I was, I tried to hide the sheepish nerd and come across more masculine. I don't know if it worked or not. Um, but uh, no, I, I, I shook her hand, and to be honest, I knew, uh, I knew right then and there that I felt uh, uh, everything I needed to feel for. And uh, then marriage ensued, and now how many children? Uh, two kids. I have two little girls. I'm now surrounded by women, and I'm, that's okay. That's perfect. My 15-year-old self always wanted to be surrounded by women, so perfect. Here it is. So you got what are their names? Uh, Hazel and Violet. Hazel's two and a half, and Violet's now eight weeks old. Wow, congratulations. Thank you very no much. No one's named Hazel anymore. I know. We really like old lady names. Hazel we was like, a television uh, show years ago. Oh, yeah, I know. About a maid. That's right. And there was also the cartoon Witch, which I'll, I'll refrain yeah. from telling my daughter about until later. But uh, Okay. After 13 hours, the secret soldiers of Benghazi came out. And you criticized politicians who use that film to attack Hillary. You know what was interesting? I was actually grossly misquoted at the time. But what it was is what I was, what I was frustrated about was not only that the politicians... I, everyone's allowed to talk about any issue however they want. That's their right. The thing that I was so frustrated about is that in the larger conversation of politics, which is going to happen and it's absolutely uh, something that we intended was going to happen with the movie, no one was talking about the, the very specific thing, which is these men were heroes. This, I did the movie to celebrate the courageous uh, act and the honor that it takes to be a man or woman on the front lines. And I thought this would be such a great opportunity, 13 Hours would be such a great opportunity to, to reinvigorate this country's love and belief and understanding of what it means to say you support your troops. So I was frustrated that that conversation was being lost in the political uh, arena. Are you a Democrat? I take it as it comes. I'm actually an independent. I. I I vote, uh, I, when I grew up, I sort of took every issue and every candidate as it comes. I, I feel like there's something for me that feels like I, I appreciate the idea of a candidate having to earn my vote. Where do you stand in this election? Right now, I mean, you know, this has been a, probably one of the most wild political uh, times ever, and I just think that this is a very important election. So my whole thing is I, I, I the, the most important thing for me when I'm watching all these things is that people vote. I hope people understand what a big time this is for us politically, and so I hope they get out. We do, we do have a little reversal, don't we? The Democratic Party looks like the party of patriotism. <laughs> right. It's true. And I think that I, I feel the lines blurring very much in this election. I feel that... Uh, I do feel that there's been a very obvious outcry for people who want their country back, and I think that's fantastic. I think people who are frustrated should be voicing their opinion. It's where all the greatness in our country has come from before, and I hope it's where the greatness comes this time. Coming up, we're talking fatherhood, role models, guilty pleasures with John Krasinski. His new movie is The Hollers. It's in theaters August 26th. We'll be right back. John Krasinski's our guest. In the old days, they'd have asked you to change your name. Right? Do right. you think so? Oh, Clark Gable, Rod <laughs> Taylor, come on. Um, I am very proud of the idea that I never changed my uh, name now. I think, to be honest, when you're, I think I started when I was 21 or 20 or something like that, I didn't even think about it. I didn't think that there would be an idea of changing your name because 
my dad's my hero. And so to be, to change my name, uh, I think that, I don't know how he'd feel about it, but I couldn't look him in the eye after I did so. Well, my father had passed away. My name was Zeiger. Oh, really? They made me change it in 1957. Really? Too ethnic. Wow. Did yeah. you ever talk to your dad about that? He had died. Oh, he died before yeah. that? Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. You, now, you've told us about the two children. How have you reacted to fatherhood? It's, you know, all the cliches are true. It's the greatest thing that's ever happened to me. I remember actually Steve Carell, uh, before I had kids, before I got married, I asked him, and I still think to this day he's described it perfectly. I said, what's it like before and after kids? And he said, there's no way to combine the two. It's like you have a favorite book that you read over and over and over and over, and then one day you put that book down and you started a new book that's your new favorite book and you can't stop reading it. And I thought, that's the perfect way to describe the, the life before and after kids. I love it. It's totally different. It is totally different. And for, for the first time in your life, someone is totally needy of you. Oh, absolutely. And I'm a crier. I have no, uh, no, no hard time saying that. And I cry at everything. And this is before my daughter's even presented me with a pasta necklace. So I don't know what's going to happen on that day. You said that before becoming a father, you now changed the way you made the hollers. Mm -hmm. How? Well, um, if I had made the movie five months before, it would have been a completely different movie. I think the, uh, my daughter was four and a half months old when I started shooting. And for me, like I said, every cliche is true. So yes, I understood the lead character's uh, dilemma of being, or his, his dilemma, I was excited, but the idea of being a man at the doorstep of having a baby. But for me, what really influenced the movie going forward was a much more weighty existential transition that I went through, which is <clears throat> I come from an amazing, tight-knit, loving family, and yet this family is very dysfunctional. But I could see something about my family in there because I think that the movie is about um, opening the lines of communication and love that are always there. There's an existential pull that your family has on you that no one else in the world will ever have. Not even your wife, not even your kids. There's something that they have on you. They know you better. And I think that returning to that is very important. Okay, John, we're going to play a little game of If You Only Knew. Okay. Who was your childhood celebrity crush? My childhood celebrity crush was probably Molly Ringwald or Vanna White. She'll be here in a minute. I know. Trust she me, it was very awkward for me. I think I, I think I pulled it off. I think I was poised enough. But when she walked in the room, it was a little weird for me. I'm not going to lie. Secret talent. My secret talent? Boy, I don't know if it was a talent, but I played uh, trumpet for nine years. Well, that's a secret. It's a pretty good talent, right? Dream role. My dream role. I don't, I've been lucky enough Is to have a such... famous play you'd like to do? Or? Yes, I've always wanted to do, uh, um, I mean, there's a, there's a bunch, but anything, any O'Neill play, um, Long Day's Journey into Night would be pretty fantastic. As the older son? Yes, as the older son. I you know, also, see? I also see as the oldest son in Death of a Salesman. Ooh, yes. thank you. Thank you. Dream co star. Dream co-star, probably my wife. I'm looking forward to working with her Are one day. Are you going to do something together? Yeah, we would love to do something together. Guilty pleasure. Guilty pleasure. Um, any sort of reality show. We are a big Bachelor and Bachelorette fan in the really? house. Yeah. It turns on and you're like, what is this? Don't ever stop. It's kind of that deal at the house. Last time you cried. Well, you cry all the time. You might have cried on seeing Vanna White. I think I did cry seeing. That's why I said it was awkward. We tried Char to take a picture and I was weeping. Characteristic you value most in others. Um, honesty. I think for me, it's just a waste of time to, to dance around subjects. Just you never honest. have to remember anything. Yeah, exactly. Last time you were starstruck. Last time I was starstruck. This is pretty. St I gotta say, I've been a big fan for a while of you. You're kidding. No, I'm serious. And by the way, I, the only thing I wanted in this interview is if I could keep this cup you because keep of this little cup. image. Thank you. Do you have a role model? Don't say it's me. So who do you have an acting? All right. Role? Well, my second role model is. Uh, my role model has always been my parents, but my dad in specific as far as who to be a man. I genuinely mean that. If I can be a what quarter of the guy. He's a, he just retired. He was a doctor, a general practitioner. And he was one of the, I think, the last great uh, doctors that he was sort of that teen, uh, the town doctor that almost felt like a Frank Capra movie. Everyone House loved calls. him. That's right, yep. What city? Uh, Newton, Massachusetts. TV show you're embarrassed to say you watch. You already discussed it, The Bachelor. <laughs> Who would you trade places with? I don't with know if I'm for, embarrassed to watch that, but okay. Who would you trade places with for a day? Who would I trade places with for a day? Wow, that is an amazing question. Um, honestly, I think there are days where I'd love to trade places with my daughter. There's something about how incredibly well, excited she is every single day. Uh, no, my two and a half year old, we walked oh, through the park won't. the other day and she, she looked like she was having the time of her yeah, life. That's great when they see birds. Oh my God. Yeah. And then they ask you what kind of bird that is, and you say, I don't know, let's go to the internet. 
Biggest misconception about Hollywood. The biggest misconception for me, at least, coming from a place that had no Hollywood connections whatsoever, Boston wasn't a big Hollywood town, was that that people are hardened and they're not very good people, that once you get famous, you're kind of uh, destined to be a jackass. And that's not true. I've met the most unbelievably me dedicated people. I remember Clooney actually said, Hollywood uh, magnifies who you are. If you come in as a good person, you can be a great person. If you come in kind of as a jerk, you're, you become a different word. Can you do any impressions? I can do some impressions. I don't know if they're good or not. Who can you do? I don't know. Who do you want to hear? No, who do you know that you do? I well? don't know. I, try, I, I, I do it usually with a couple drinks, Larry. So is there anything in here? Can you do you George can... Clooney now? No, nobody can do, no, do no, George Clooney. No, you can't Clooney. do George Yeah, Clooney. you have to have like a glimmer in your eye, and that's surgical. If you weren't an actor, what would you be? If I wasn't an actor, I'd be an English teacher. That's what you majored in. That's what I majored in. That's what I wanted to be. Weirdly, because of Dead Poet Society, I thought, I can make kids stand on desks. What a movie. Yeah, it was a great movie. Something you long to believe, you long believed to be true and realized wasn't. In the best way possible, uh, that your parents are superheroes. I remember the day that you realized that your parents are real, and I've been thinking about this a lot with the Hollers, but uh, that, was an, that was an amazing day, and that's not a negative day. It's just such a, I actually bonded so much closer to my parents when you realize they're real, they make mistakes, and they're, they're trying to be great people every day, too. What's something people don't know about you? I don't know. You've gotten a lot out of me today that I didn't want to talk about. Um, I don't, I don't well, know. Oh, we didn't bring up communism? That's true. That. that you know I'm a raging we communist? that out, <laughs> yes. Um, no, I don't know what people well, don't know about in, me. You said, don't ask about the commie. Don't ask about the commie stuff, yeah, totally. So and I call it commie ever, just because We it's know fun. everything about you. I think so. All right, we'll find out more because John is going to answer your social media questions and romantic proposals. Done. In our final segment. Stay with us. John Krasinski is our guest. The Hollers will be in theaters <clears throat> August 26th. Before we get into social media questions, you said of 13 hours... I think we tell a lot of superhero stories. It's nice to tell a story about real heroes. Mm -hmm. I come from a big military family. Oh, you um, yeah, a lot of aunts and uncles and cousins who have served and are currently serving. So for me, um, I've always wanted to be in a movie that uh, I could be anywhere close to telling their story. And this one came along, and I felt that this was such a perfect example of that. I think that you know, if you see the movie, and certainly meeting the guys who are who are actually involved, I don't know that I've ever met truer heroes in my life. That's that's a different level of of uh, commitment, and uh, to to the rest of us, you can say that you're a patriot, but I think that they live something very, very superhuman every single day. Is there a superhero you'd like to play? Well, you're going to play Jack Ryan, who's it's a pretty good superhero, right? I mean, I guess he can't like see through walls or anything. But if I had to play a superhero, if there's anything left in the Marvel universe, I'll do it. I love those movies. You like those? I love those movies. Yeah. Some social media questions at always implied tweets. How much has being from New England influenced you? Oh, great question. Um, I hope a lot. I, I am so proud to be from New England. Um, I actually just moved back to the East Coast because of that. I think that I loved being here in California, but there was something about seasons. Oh, you live east I, now? Yeah, we just moved back to New York. So I missed uh, the, color, the leaves changing, to be really honest. And you and Conan have that tie. We do. We have that tie. We're kind of like a gang. <laughs> Sahia Khalil via Facebook. You hear a lot about actors resenting the show, a role that made them famous. Have you ever felt that way about The Office? Not at all. In fact, every single day, I am thankful for it. Like I said, I live a lottery ticket life. And not only that, but we were on a show that I think was really sort of in that, at the beginning of this transition of television and film having a blurred line. The reason why is a lot of people can say they're thankful to their fans, but we actually, our fans literally saved our show, meaning our show is going to be canceled on NBC for the first two seasons. And it was only when people started buying the show on iTunes. They were paying for something that was being offered for free. I think it blew the minds of the network and realized they had to keep it. So our fans legitimately are the reason why we're here. Was it hard to do comedy with no audience? It, it wasn't because it felt like a play. I felt like the, the, the writing was so good. We didn't know. We were trying so to live real life. You didn't think he was funny? I, the, the, characters the characters didn't think he was funny. No, not at all. Maria Bassi on Facebook wants to know when you knew Emily was the one. From the second I shook her hand, that's the truth. I think that I, I, my goal after that was just to make sure she knew that I was the one for her, which took a little more finesse, but uh, I knew right away. At Nason Emily tweets, ask him if he'll go on a date with me and he can bring the other Emily along. Yes. That's He's fine. We can do that. Threesomes or that's the other thing he didn't admit to. Anyway, <laughs> at DTW, will you be headed back to sitcom comedy at all? 
I don't know. Again, for me, it's always about the story. If you can, if you got the right role, you yeah, want to do that every for week sure. again. It's, it's just fun to do. It's just fun to. First of all, it's fun to be an actor, and and it's a. It's just so lucky to be doing it. So, if there's something that I can get uh, get attached to and do that, I think I'm the right guy for it. Absolutely. Any more directing in the future? Would love to. Absolutely. Again, it's one of those things. Like Clooney said, you got to find the right role that feels like you're the fir you're the only guy who can tell it. There's a lot of great directors out there, so you have to have a take that's different than everybody else. Don't direct just to direct. Are you looking for a role with your wife? Absolutely. I would love to work with my wife. The truth is, we've been talking about working together forever. It shouldn't it's very be hard. A lot of films and TV shows have people about men and women. Yes. You know? <laughs> He's still got it, guys. Mm -hmm. He's still got it. Um, no, I think the problem is finding a story that's powerful enough that won't be superseded by the idea of the headlines being that we're married. So when the, when the movie comes out, we don't want the headlines just to be that we were married. It, 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 we want it to be about the film. So you even take a part, let's say, where she has a lover. All right, just calm down. Oh, calm down, okay. All right. Where, where, where do you see yourself in five years? Where do Don I see? Krasinski is where? I think I'm at a parent-teacher conference. Uh -huh. And I just hope that nothing undoable has been done by my daughter. Your daughter, you don't want to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, John. Thank you so much. This was Great a real guest. pleasure. Thank you. Thank, keep the cup. <laughs> Thanks to my guest, John Krasinski. The Hollers is in theaters August 26th. As always, you can find me on Twitter at King's Things. See you next time.